Alexis Nicole Nelson is a content creator who has fostered a huge following by sharing her hilarious and educational plant foraging videos. When she's not working her nine to five, Alexis helps her followers identify and prepare edible plants she finds growing around her neighborhood in Columbus, Ohio. We are very excited to have Alexis with us today. And so I will turn it over to you, Alexis. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for the intro, Grace. And I'm so excited to be here. Thank you to the U.S. Botanic Garden for having me. I'm so stoked to lead this class. There is an, a nearly overwhelming amount of love coming from the chat right now. And that just warms my whole heart. It's a little cloudy here in Ohio today, but it feels like the sun is shining now. So thank you all so much for joining. Um, we, when I originally crafted the idea for this class, I wanted to focus on unexpected edibles, um, making sure that they were able to be found in like the mid-Atlantic region. But as it became apparent that a lot of people from not just the mid-Atlantic or the Midwest were also going to be tuning in, I tried to kind of widen the breadth of what I was covering. So a lot of it is not only what you can find spread out across the U.S. and Canada into Mexico, um, but also a lot of plants that you will find specifically in cityscapes. Uh, I tried to also focus in on a lot of native species, um, but there are some fun ornamentals that we're going to talk about today, too. And oh my gosh, I'm just I'm excited to get started. Let me go ahead and queue up my presentation. Do, 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 do. Oh, there it is. Hello, that is not the date that it is today. That is the date that I last edited this presentation. So we're getting started on a great foot already. So for anybody who for a second thought it was the 18th, it's not, I'm checking, it's the 24th. So we're starting off with an apology. Good job, me. Welcome to Unexpected Foraging, Mid-Atlantic Edition, but put like an asterisk after that in your mind because that's not the only place where you can find most of these. But I will say that there are two plants at the end that are just going to have to be your excuse to come visit us either in the Mid-Atlantic or the Midwest at some point in the near future as the world starts uh, becoming safer again. Who am I? We already had a really great intro from Grace that I am not going to be able to top. Uh, I exclusively refer to myself as a goober who eats plants that don't belong to me. Uh, so that's that's what I do. Uh, also, that screenshot that I took of my TikTok from a week ago is no longer what it looks like. Several videos have been uploaded since then, but I am at Alexis Nicole on TikTok. I am Black Forager on Instagram. If, uh, you, if you don't know who I am and you want to hang out digitally later and keep tabs on all of the weird wild stuff that I am eating. Yeah. So first, because I know this is what I get the most questions about across the board, we're gonna do a quick talk about safety because I want all of you sweet beans to be safe. So some locations that you might want to avoid while you are going on your first, second, 50th, 1,000th foraging foray out into the world. Areas that are like directly along the sidewalks. Uh, I just kind of refer to those as like the P barriers. And that's not to say that I am afraid of plants that have ever been peed on because I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but if it's a green space that exists on this planet, something has peed on it at some point in time in the not too distant past. Um, but that's not just true of what you're foraging. That's also true of like veggies you get at the grocery store. So just wash everything that you bring home, folks. Wash everything that you bring home and don't get too, don't get too in your head about it. Urea is a major component in a lot of fertilizers. It's, uh, you just don't want it to be freshly on the food that you're eating. That's not appetizing. Shout out to Tom Greenwell who said a little pee never hurt. That's the energy that we're bringing to the chat today. Next, probably want to avoid tracks directly along old houses. The neighborhood that I live in here in Columbus has a lot of houses that are 100 plus years old. And when you have a house that is that, that old and the house has been painted at any point in time, 
during the early part of its history, the odds of there being lead around the house are a little bit higher than the odds of there being lead elsewhere in, say, the yard surrounding the house. It's just something to think about. If you were ever wanting to test the soil in your yard, there are actually a lot of universities that offer free or extraordinarily cheap soil testing. For my friends here in central Ohio, OSU sells them for a mere $5 each. You just fill them up with some dirt. You put the dirt in the mail. They uh, give you your results in a couple of weeks. Uh, and then you can see how healthy the soil that you are wanting to plant things in is also a great tip for if you're wanting to start a community garden. Don't collect from alongside super busy roads. Now for me, what I constitute a super busy road is one that is like wider than two lanes long. Once again, nothing exists in a bubble. A lot of farms are alongside highways. We're all a little bit polluted. There's a little bit of plastic in all of us. So <laughs> be smart in the choices that you're making. Gathering directly along highways is probably not it, mama. That's not the safest thing that you could be doing. Here in the Midwest, not only is there a ton of exhaust coming off of the side of highways, but we salt the crap out of them every single winter, and you don't want to be eating that either. I care about you and your insides. <laughs> Collecting along railroad tracks is a no-no because one, if the railroad track is active, usually at least once a year, they're gonna come through and spray herbicides to keep plants from growing up and onto the train tracks. Don't eat herbicides. They're not tasty. They're not uh, Gucci, as the kids no longer say. I'm almost 100% sure the kids no longer say Gucci. Not something you wanna be putting into your face. Also, there just tends to be a whole lot of uh, heavy metal in the soil around railroads, especially if they have been around for a long time. Stay away from golf courses. We can do a different TED talk on my disdain for golf courses and how that's going to be what gets me written out of every single one of my family members' wills. I come from a very pro golf family. I'm very anti-monoculture though. So that's just like my fun opinion that I have to keep to myself at family functions. But anytime that you see rolling hills of pristine grass with no biodiversity, Chemicals went into that. <laughs> so don't eat the few little dandelions that are hanging out around the edges being like rebellious, sticking their little dandelion middle fingers up at the rest of the grass. Not a safe bet. Um, and then obviously industrial sites, uh, if, especially if it is an industrial site in which uh, hazardous materials are being produced or are one of the, uh, the after effects, precipitates. Every single word except the word that I want is uh, coming to mind. If they produce anything hazardous, don't forage around them. Another cool pro tip, if you wanna make yourself a little bit anxious, the EPA keeps uh, a rolling list of reported spills going. You can zoom in on your area and see where all the blue dots are. Not every reported spill is a reported spill of something dangerous and you do get to click on it and see what it is and whether or not it is a concern. So there's our intro to safety. I hope that that answers some of the questions that uh, I usually inevitably come into with a lot of these classes. But now let's get to the good part. Let's talk about the stuff you can put in your face. <laughs> For starters, because talking about the U.S. Botanic Garden elicits images of the Mid-Atlantic and of D.C. And I know cherry blossom season has already passed there. We are at the tail end of it here in the kind of central southern Midwest people further north of us. You still can be taking advantage of cherry blossoms. So with our prunus species, the edible parts are going to be the blossoms, the leaves, and the palms. A trend in here is going to be that I don't think we talk about eating leaves off of trees enough. So we're going to dive into a couple trees in which that is a possibility. With uh, Tasta, good job, Alexis. If we all just can collectively pretend that that A at the end of taste is an E, I would most appreciate it. My ego needs it. <laughs> 
The fruits will vary a lot in taste and texture between species and even within species, but between trees. So what I will tell you is that cherries, wild cherries of varying kinds will not hurt you, but some of them will taste better than others. And the pits are things that you want to avoid, like pretty much every fruiting tree in uh, the rose family. You don't want to be eating the seeds. Uh, except for service berries, but we'll get to them and <laughs> we'll get to them in a couple of slides. But while some cherries are not necessarily what you say you want to make a cherry turnover with, some of them are really great for, say, infusing into booze for a fun kind of fruity bitters moment, or for sweetening and simmering in some like sugary water to make like a cherry juice. There are a lot of things that you can do with fruits that raw maybe because of their size or their texture or their taste ain't it uh, but with a little zhuzhing and with a little help in the kitchen they can be it in terms of cherry blossoms um i don't know how many of you are familiar with um like sakura blossoms in japan but most often those blossoms are salt cured which is a super fun process if you ever want to do it once i feel like for a lot of us doing it once is enough <laughs> <laughs> I salt cured cherry blossoms for the first time last year, and I simply did not muster up the energy to do it this year, but it is a process of separating your flowers, keeping them on the stems though, cleaning them, pressing them between layers of salt, which kind of mummifies them. Uh, that's really not hyperbole. That's pretty much exactly what's happening. And then you can go on to rinse the salt off and then leave them in vinegar for a while to continue curing and then dry them. Or you can go and pack them in sugar and then end up with sweet salt cured cherry blossoms. They're real fun to put into sushi, to put on top of rice dishes. They also make a really pretty blooming tea. Uh, because of the curing process, they stay pretty intact. So even though they look dry and shrivelly once you dry them up, if you drop them into a cup of hot water, They'll open up and bloom inside like those expensive teas from the places. I don't know. I typically don't buy blooming teas, but I know that they exist. I typically just make them myself. The leaves also salt cure and pickle extremely well, um, packed in with a little bit of salt or put through the same salt curing process that you would use for the flowers. Also, if you catch the leaves early enough while they still have a bit of a sheen on them, you can like wrap little bits of rice in them, use them to garnish salads. Uh, it is a good fun time. Boo, 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 boo. Ba, 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 ba. There's some fun conversations going on in the chat that I'm trying really hard to not immediately jump into because this could become 17 different presentations. <laughs> so speaking of service berries, slash June berries, slash Saskatoon berries. Uh, in parts of Southern Ohio, we just call them Sarvis, period. I don't know where the berry part got lost in translation, or someone was just too tired to say the whole word and that stuck. Uh, but those are your Amelanchia species. They are native to North America, but cities freaking love using them as ornamentals, love using them to have growing along uh, streets. My street personally in my neighborhood is not lucky enough to have one. We have exclusively Bradford pears, which only makes me cry all the time. But many of the other streets in my neighborhood are lined with service berry trees. And the edible parts on that are going to be the fruits, the cute little palms and the leaves. Shout out to the Rose family for holding it down with a whole lot of our favorite fruits. Our apples, our pears, our crab apples, our service berries, our cherries. Imagine doing that much legwork. I can't imagine it. So service berries honestly are my like favorite secret in the realm of urban foraging. They taste a whole lot like an apple had a baby with a blueberry, but the texture is better than you think it's going to be. The thing that I said about seeds earlier is super important with like pretty much any of the other rose family members you were going to forage with the exception of service berries. You can eat them whole, but I will say that processing the whole berry in some sort of heated process, be that grinding it all up and making a fruit leather out of it, 
or a fermentation process like making a fermented Juneberry syrup uh, will process those seeds a little bit and make them taste very marzipan-y, which I think is super fun. Uh, if you want to make a fermented Juneberry syrup, it is my favorite method of preservation because it is extremely lazy. Most methods of preserving things are a little bit labor intensive and require heating things correctly and sealing things correctly and storing things correctly. Whereas fermented Juneberry syrup is very forgiving. You just simply take a jar and you fill it up halfway with Juneberries and then you fill up the additional half with sugar and then you give it a little, little shake so the sugar settles into all of the spaces and the sugar will draw the moisture out of the June berries, but also the sugar content is high enough that they will not start rotting or breaking down. The wild yeast present on the skins of the June berries will then start going to work on that sugary moisture that is being pulled out of the berries and will kind of uh, like it's not pickling because it's not the same uh, bacteria at work, but will essentially preserve them in this syrup that is being produced around them. And the berries will kind of shrink in size and you can fish them out when you want to and put them on top of ice creams or add them to tarts and then flavor things with the syrup that is made as well. For no reason at all, I'm hanging on to both the last of my Juneberry compote in my freezer. And also I have my jar of my fermented Juneberry syrup with nar not nary more than a tablespoon of syrup left in the jar with like three berries. I don't know what I'm saving it for, but Juneberries aren't ready here yet. So what if I want them before they're back? <laughs> I'm very bad about hoarding things until they come into season again. <laughs> that is one of my biggest vices, especially with plants that I'm very passionate about. It's also why I have a tub of frozen pawpaw puree in my freezer just behind me. We will talk about pawpaws later. Do, do, do. Next is magnolia. This was one that I did not expect to kind of be a surprise smash hit on my own socials media, but Magnolias, both the imported ones, which are typically the very pretty white and pink to deep maroon to almost like pinky lavender colored ones. Those are the ones that are imported and are native to um, the forests of China. And then we have our native magnolias, which for folks who are in the mid-Atlantic or in the South, you are probably much more familiar with than the rest of us as that is the area that they are native to. And our native magnolias would be magnolia, um, oh my goodness, uh, you know, words are not coming to mind right now. Virginiana is sweet name magnolia. And then the one whose Latin name means big, that's the southern magnolia. And it's going to come to me in 10 minutes when we're not talking about them anymore. And you're all just going to have to bear with me when I feel the need to say it so I can prove to myself that I remember. So when it comes to edible bits, you have the flowers and that's the petals and the sepally bits in the middle. Fun fact, uh, the bits in the middle of magnolias are super hardy because they uh, stopped evolving before our pollinators as we know them were finished evolving. So back when they first kind of came into being in the iteration that we're familiar with, beetles and large insects had to, do, had to do the job of pollinating them, which is one, why the flowers have to be so sturdy, period, to be able to hold them up so a beetle doesn't just fall through them when it lands on it. But that also means that it's uh, little pollination areas have to be pretty tough and pretty hardy too. Raw, those centers of the flowers um, range anywhere from kind of cardamomy to very bitter. That being said, pickling them or giving them a quick blanch before you use them in something uh, whole and raw would be my recommendation. The petals are extraordinarily gingery. Well, okay, there's a spectrum that goes like ginger, citrus, floral, bitter, and all of the magnolias imported in natives petals fall somewhere in between those four points. So like in my opinion, um, saucer magnolias, which is a hybrid magnolia species between magnolia lilliflora and magnolia deandata, they're very popular. Odds are if you have a big pink and white magnolia in your city, it's probably a saucer magnolia. Those guys are very much in like 
the little top area skewing very close to ginger, but also a little bit citrusy and a little bit floral as well. Whereas I feel like our native magnolia skew much more floral, much more citrus. A way that I don't hear people talking about magnolias as much is using the leaves in place of bay leaves. Sweet bay magnolias have that name for a reason, and it is because their leaves especially are the best dupe, in my opinion, for a bay leaf in your, uh, your cooking adventures. But you could do the same with any magnolia leaves. Caveat, magnolia leaves are very big. So you will not need like an entire magnolia leaf this far across put into uh, your dupe of chipotle rice. It will be very bay -y, and that's not what you want. So the good thing is one leaf goes a really long way. And it's one additional leaf that won't take just a bajillion years to compost and break down underneath your tree when it's done shedding them at the end of the season. Because boy golly, magnolia leaves take a very long time to break down. It used to be my mom's least favorite thing about the tree in front of the house I grew up in. Do, do, do. Mulberries. We're just kicking it with the trees right now. We're going to talk about not trees soon. But these are the trees that I see a lot of cities planting, so I wanted to make sure that we covered them. Mulberries are our Morris species. There are both imported mulberries and native mulberries. Um, but they are both very similar in terms of taste and the way that their leaves look. And the edible parts are going to be the berries and the young leaves. Once again, while they still are very soft and have that bit of new leaf shine, this is the time of year to go out and acquaint yourself with new leaf shine as all of the trees are putting out their leaves before leaves get very stringy and tough and established. They are very, uh, very soft to the touch and have a nice glisten on top of them. And that's what you want to be looking for. Mulberries are very versatile. Um, they accompany June berries in terms of taste extraordinarily well, which is also fitting because in a lot of parts of the United States, they come into ripeness at around the same time. Here, we typically see June berries kicking things off and mulberries then overlapping with them a little bit. And then we're still finding ripe mulberries after June berries are done doing the thing. They are, in my opinion, a bit more tart. They air a bit more tart, but much like with June berries and a whole lot of other fruits, flavor varies a ton between species and flavor varies a ton between trees. Uh, where a tree is growing makes a pretty big difference in terms of how the uh, fruit is going to taste because the amount of water it's getting varies, the amount of sun it is getting varies, um, whether or not it is also dealing with any stressors varies, and all of that has a variable effect on the fruit. I had a mulberry tree in our backyard growing up, and I would just sit underneath it and eat berries raw for a really long time. I don't think they really need processing necessarily. They're also great for dyeing things as a whole lot of uh, articles of clothing in my childhood found out the hard way. A fun unexpected thing to do with the leaves is I use them to make mulberry matcha. It's not caffeinated, so don't get too excited. But taste-wise, Wonderful dupe for matcha, both for tea making and for incorporating into any baked goods to make them matcha flavored. Last year, I made a mulberry matcha mug cake. It's a lot of letter M's. I love an accidental alliteration. And it was absolutely delicious. And mug cakes are great because sometimes I make recipes that take six hours to put together. And sometimes you just want to put something in the microwave and have it done in a minute. And I will do a video about that mug cake this year so everyone else can enjoy the joy of a baked good that it goes from batter to finished and in your face in 60 seconds. Don't start eating it the second it comes out of the microwave. It'll be very hot. So put an asterisk after 60 seconds. But the process is essentially processing the leaves like you would process tea leaves to make a green tea, which is steaming them to stop their biological processes, Pressing them, usually just between your hands, is good enough. 
uh, and then drying them in a warm, not hot pan. You do not want to scorch them and then letting them sit for a day before use. And at that point, you can either just throw the leaves into a tea bag or into your hot water and use them as a green tea dupe, period, or go and throw them into a spice grinder and grind them up to make a very fine matcha. It's super tasty. Um, you can also do that uh, green tea processing with mugwort, which we're not going to talk about because I never know if people recognize it. And so many people conflate it with ragweed and I don't want to set anyone's allergies off. We can talk about mugwort after this chat if you want to. <laughs> Hey, Alexis, we've got some questions about some of the plants we've talked about so far. Do yeah. you mind if I toss a couple questions your way? Oh, please do. Awesome. So we've got, can you make jam and pie filling from service berries? You absolutely can, and it is divine. I know, Grace, we were just talking about this before the talk started. Last year, so what I do is I make Juneberry hand pies in which I will make a Juneberry jelly. Uh, they're also very like pectin laden, so they make a very satisfying jelly without having to add pectin into them, which every time that I don't have to figure out the mathematics and the balance of sugar, citrus, and pectin into a jelly, that's a dream for me. So it's, it, it turns the most gorgeous color. Uh, very hard to come across in video. I tried last year, but it makes a superb pie filling, a superb jam, a superb jelly. Um, I love making jams with it only because the seeds do take on that kind of marzipan-y flavor after they've been cooked a little bit. So having them in there both for texture and for taste is phenomenal. Great question. Thanks, Alexis. And another one is, do mulberries or Juneberries have any lookalikes that should be avoided? So when it comes to crowned berries and compound berries, here in North America, you are safe. Um, it's, the, it's the rounded berries with no immediate identifiers on them that you have to know a whole lot more about the plant in general. Uh, but when it comes to mulberries and Juneberry trees especially, I could see you maybe conflating Juneberries with pin cherries, though pin cherries are not crowned at the bottom like Juneberries are. Those are it's really a great identifier. Also, Juneberries will be fruiting already before a lot of their other rose tree family members, which is a great way to tell them apart from the rest too. And mulberries are very hard to conflate with any other tree. We don't have a lot of trees here that also produce compound berries. In fact, I'm going through my Rolodex of plants right now. If I think of one, I will say it later, but right now no trees with compound berries that you will find commonly in North America are coming to mind. Okay, and then I'll take, um, we'll do one more question before we continue to hear about all these awesome plants. Um, so we've got some questions about, first of all, lots of folks in the chat came up with our magnolia name, which is Grandiflora. Thank you, Jess. Yes, folks. thank you. Yes, big <laughs> flower, Grandiflora. Thank yes. you, friends. And we've got a couple of folks saying, is it okay to eat from trees like magnolias? Or someone said they have a bay that's by their house um, that are along streets? Or is it too much pollution? So... That's one that I kind of have to take on a street by street and tree by tree basis. I will say plants in general, the order of operations for what's going to be the worst for you from a plant in an area that is gently polluted is going to be roots, followed by the woody bits, followed by the leaves, followed by the flowers, followed by the fruits um, in order of like most oh no to most okay. So, if it's a really busy street, if we're talking like a highway, I would say to go ahead and leave those alone, which never feels good when you've found something, but it's not in an area that is particularly safe. That being said, I have been eating magnolia petals from just off of a two lane road here in the city. And I live like in the city, in the city. I'm not in the suburbs, I'm in Columbus proper. To, to no ill effects, to no tummy aches, uh, to no ill effects that we know of yet. I will add that caveat. So it really depends. And when it comes to if you're in your neighborhood, I know a lot of people also ask me, well, how do I know that that tree isn't somewhere that's been sprayed? 
I am so sorry. You have to talk to your neighbors. You have to talk to your neighbors. Ask them if they spray their yard. That is how I have made a whole lot of friends <laughs> in the neighborhood. Um, it's just, and sometimes I'll just like leave a note with like my email on it and be like, hey, you have this very interesting plant in your yard. I don't know if you know that it's interesting. Here's why it is interesting. Do you spray your yard? Would you be willing to share it with me? Yes or no? <laughs> Here's my email. It's nice being your neighbor. <laughs> I know introverts, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm an extrovert and it makes me nervous so I can only imagine, but it's such a great way to make unexpected friends. Well, thanks Alexis. I'll let us get back to uh, beautiful maples. Of course. Yeah, let's uh, jump right on into maples. I just did a video about these, but uh, I just feel like they are worth talking about because maples are not just syrup. They can do so much more. That being said, I do have a picture of a sugar maple leaf and sugar maple flyers because I feel like those are the most critically acclaimed maples that we have here in North America because they, uh, Acer saccharum has the highest sugar content in its sap, which means you do not need as much of it to cook down to make a good syrup. So when we're talking about the edible parts of maples, and this is maples across the board, we're talking all of our acers, even some of the really cool ornamental Japanese maples, the edible parts are going to be the sap flow, that first sap flow, which for some of us comes in late winter, for some of us comes in early fall, come on, early spring, Week ago, Alexis did not have her life together. Goodness gracious, great balls of fire. So you're going to wanna make sure that you are getting the sap flow before the tree is even starting to like think about putting out its flowers for the year. Once it is starting to put its energy into flower production, into the beginnings of leaf production, the sap is just going to start tasting a lot greener and a lot less good. Uh, that It's not the kind of stuff that you want to be cooking down and condensing and putting onto your pancakes. Uh, next would be the new leaves. Once again, that new leaf sheen, while they're still pretty small, I love taking the new leaves and dipping them into a little bit of tempura batter and then throwing them into a skillet with a little bit of hot oil. Because not only are they a tasty treat, but they look super cool. Uh, just little crunchy tempura to maple leaves. And also the helicopter seeds. I don't know about all of you, and I was also just talking to Grace about this. For me as a kid, this was one of those plants that like no one had to tell me that maple flyers were edible. I feel like kids a lot of times will just like do some mental math in their head where they're like, well, this thing from this plant is useful. So my guess is this part of this plant must also be useful. I'm going to eat it. So I used to just sit and peel the papery helicopter sheets off of the seeds because they just look like little like sunflower pepita-esque seeds inside. Just pop them into my mouth. They do, they do get bitter the more that the maple flyers dry, but that's nothing that a quick little boil, a quick little blanch can't take care of. But when they're at the stage that they are in this picture where even the helicopter is still green, and soft, the whole thing is edible. Uh, I know a lot of folks will just take those whole flyers and toss them onto salads, toss them into some sauteed wilted greens. They're really tasty, but I love the roasted seeds. Love the roasted seeds, they're so tasty. This year I wanna try and make a maple seed butter. I feel like it has to be possible. I feel like the fat content is there. If you never hear about it again, it's because it was a failure. Don't tell anybody that I said it if you never hear about it again. <laughs> That's my rule across the board. If I mention a recipe to you and then you never see any evidence of it on social media, it is because it was a tragic failure and I'm still making peace with it in my home. <laughs> Whoa, Ohio is the third largest producer of maple syrup in the US. Okay, yeah, Canada obviously kicks our butt. Whoa. I had no idea. I know we have a lot of sugar maples here in Ohio, but we also have a lot of Norway maples uh, and a lot of red maples, which are eh, which leads me to a caveat. Red maples aren't great for livestock, 
there have been no studies that sh have shown that red maples are also not good for people. But if you have a horse, uh, don't let them just nosh on a ton of red maple leaves because it'll make them not feel good. For any of us who are, are lucky enough to be equine inclined, uh, good for you and your horse. <laughs> yes, boo, Norway maples. Uh, are they pretty? Yes. Can you also tap them for sap? Yes. Are they like pretty invasive? I would, I would consider them a light invasive. Uh, also, yes, please eat all of their seeds. It is my goal this year, as the seeds come into ripeness, to just eat all of the Norway maple seeds in my neighborhood. <laughs> so they can't make tiny babies, uh, though there are already a lot of tiny babies from past seasons. Bleh. Oaks! Don't go getting excited. This isn't like maples where things other than the thing everybody knows about is also edible. It's just acorns. But I, do, I feel like acorns do not get their time in the sun. Obviously a very uh, prolific and popular indigenous food staple across the United States between all of the different Quercus species. Though there are some acorns that I would say are better for processing in terms of time management than others. Burr oaks, I, I like because they are bigger, so you just get more bang for your buck. Uh, swamp white oaks process super quickly. In fact, historically, most of the white oaks that I have encountered process very quickly. And therein lies what I think uh, doesn't have acorns being as celebrated as I feel like they should, and it is that you have to process them before you can eat them. And if you want to use them for cool things like their starch, you have to process them the long way. And the long way can take anywhere from 24 hours. I have had white oak acorns that have, uh, that I've leached the tannins out to the point at which they are not even the littlest bit bitter in 24 hours of just changing their water <sighs> to red oaks, which are the most prolific in my neighborhood and also the chonkiest in my neighborhood. And every year I fool myself into thinking that gathering them is a good idea and that they won't take that long to leach the tannins out of them. But last year it took me three weeks of changing the water twice a day for my ground red oak acorns, not even whole ones, ground ones for exposed surface area in order to get them to a point of palatability that I deemed worth eating and serving to people that I care about. So when I think about that, sometimes I understand why acorns are maybe not talked about as much. But if you are lucky enough to live near a black oak, a white oak, um, I would say go for it. They're, it's a fun family activity, shelling acorns together. But the general process for cold processing is shelling your acorns. You can do that while they are still pretty fresh. Or if you want it to be even a little bit easier, you can let them dry on a screen, on a covered porch, or in a cool, dry area for a week or so. Go ahead and crack those outer shells off of them. Make sure the papery sheath on the nut meat <laughs> on the inside is completely removed. And then for cold leaching, what I do is I grind up the nut meat, put them into a jelly bag, and either have water running across them continuously. If you have a stream on your property, I'm so serious. Just toss your acorn grounds into a nice little closed baggie. If you trust them to not get stolen by woodland creatures, tie them to a little bit of string and just leave them in this is the running stream for a day. Uh, if it is not, a red oak, you will likely come back to properly leached grounds the next day. We love low effort solutions. Uh, creative problems need creative solutions. It's not a creative solution. That has been what people have done with acorns for literally thousands of years. And uh, if you otherwise, if you don't have a stream on your property, you can just leave them in a big old thing of cool water. And when you notice that the, wa the color of the water has changed because of the tannins, you dump it out. You give them a nice little rinse, you squeeze out all of the excess, and then you put them into a fresh cup of water. And you do that until the water stops changing colors and the grounds don't taste bitter uh, and take all the moisture out of your mouth because that's what tannins like to do. Or you can hot process them, which is the process of putting them into changes of hot water 
Do not let them cool down in between. You are going to want to have a dual pot system going for hot processing your acorns. At that point, the starch in them is destroyed. So if you are trying to do things like make acorn jelly or have acorn flour that is able to kind of bind to itself, you will not get that from hot leached acorns, but you will get like a nut that you can roast and snack on like a peanut. And I do think that acorns are legitimately very tasty, like worth the effort. Acorn pancakes are a winter staple in my house that I absolutely love. And to Cindy, yes, I have also heard that you can leach them in your toilet tank. I know that the upper tank is clean water. I know it. My brain knows it. But the lizard brain in me is like, but I don't want to do that, even though I know that it is the smarter option. We should be more like Cindy. <laughs> Edible conifers. So here we have our we have a pine, a white pine specifically. If you're ever trying to tell that something is a white pine, it will have five needles coming out of that same little uh, same little joint where they connect to their branches, as opposed to some of our other pines, which will have two or three. Uh, I also have a cute little picture of a Douglas fir because I like their cones, and a blue spruce because they're uh, very recognizable and also at that stage very pokey. Uh, and those your Pines, your spruces, your firs, and your hemlocks are our edible conifers. I did not add a picture of a hemlock because in a lot of parts of the United States, our hemlock trees are in gentle peril. So I don't really want to be encouraging people to eat a ton of them unless you live in an area where they are super prolific. Uh, if you just live in the middle of a hemlock forest, you do you, boo. Go to town. Eat those, eat those little bits of new growth this time of year. Get that vitamin C. Knock yourself out. I took up a lot of space for the picture, so I had to put a different slide together for <laughs> the information portion. In terms of the edible parts, you have your needles. New growth, which you will start seeing this time of year if you are not seeing it already, and even the more established ones too, though they are a lot tougher and a lot more resinous than the new growth. Your pollen and your pollen cones, which is just spruce pollen is wreaking havoc on my neighborhood right now. <laughs> Uh, the inner white bark, not the outer bark. Do not eat the outer bark. And honestly, unless you have a ton of pine trees to spare, maybe don't eat the white inner bark either um, because you have to damage the tree to get to it. If you're starving, no hate, no shade. Um, if you're in like an into the wild situation, but before the bad thing happens, go off. Eat what you need to to survive. So I just want to make sure you have that knowledge too. Also, the immature cones, while they are still green and not woody, and additionally, the seeds from inside the cones that have substantive seeds, which is mostly just going to be your pinion pines, pinion pines, uh, and then the resin and the pitch, which I have a picture of uh, above the pine nuts. In terms of uses, I tried to kind of zero in on generalized uses for each of the edible parts we mentioned. New growth needles are fun to eat raw. Give them a little nibble before you bring a ton home because some will be very bright and lemony. Some will almost be a little bit like resinous and sweet and bright. Some will just be very bitter. Uh, I broke one off of a blue spruce in my neighborhood this week because they're starting to shed their little papery sheets on their new needles. And it was very bitter. And I like bitter a little bit, but I was like, okay, so this tree is not where I'm going to be gathering uh, my new needles from this year. And that's okay and that's okay. Uh, they're really fun to make jellies out of, to make a little like spruce tip jelly, little pine needle jelly. Uh, uh, they make a really fun thing to sprinkle on top of salads or incorporate into savory and sweet dishes. Um, established needles make for a really nice tea. If you, for whatever reason, have scurvy, make tea with pine needles. We love a, a source of vitamin C that isn't a citrus. Um, and also can be ground down and mixed into a sugar or a salt to use as a spice or flavoring agent. I will warn you that you will want to have a very strong spice slash coffee grinder if you are going to do this because they are very tough and they are very resinous. And when you do it and you don't break your grinder like I did this summer with my first spice grinder, you are then going to want to immediately clean it with an alcohol of some sort because that resin will stick. To the person who I see saying, ask, uh, ask Socrates, Socrates, hemlock 
is one of those names that people decided to give to two very different things. The hemlock that you are thinking of is poison hemlock, which is in the carrot family. And that is what killed uh, Socrates and is also just slowly taking over a lot of disturbed land here in the Midwest. Once again, that's a different, that's a different TED talk. I could do one on just the carrot family members period because there's so much tasty and so much peril in one family. But back to, back to our conifers, um, pollen is really great to use in place of some of the flour in baked goods. I would not say to replace all of the flour because then your baked good will likely not hold together the way that you want to. It will be a bit too crumbly. It'll kind of uh, just fade into beautiful pieces in your hand and in your mouth. Um, but it is a really nice kind of warm, bright agent to add into say a shortbread cookie with a little bit of lemon or a little bit of honey. Um, if you do honey, dandelion honey, if you don't do honey, uh, which is now the time of year that you could make dandelion honey, which is just making a dandelion syrup and cooking it down until it has a thicker consistency. Woo. And then of course, pine nuts, which are crazy expensive. If you are lucky enough to live near a pine tree that produces uh, substantial enough nuts to eat, please just go and gather them yourself if you really need them for pesto. Also, we should break up with the idea that pine nuts are the only nuts that you can use in pesto because they're not. Uh, if, you're, if you are but a poor forager like me, I use walnuts in my pesto all the time. And if you give them a little roasty toasty first, no one can tell the difference. Um, also, the resin can be chewed uh, like gum and studies are being done about it's like antimicrobial properties, which is super fun. I feel like in the next 50 years, we're probably going to see a lot of like science now coming in to back up a lot of ethnobotany um, that has been passed down between a lot of groups globally. And I, for one, am very excited to be alive as that's happening. Ooh, pecans in pesto. That is an A plus choice. We love a pecan. We love a pecan. A pecan. <laughs> Lookalike alert. While we're talking about edible conifers, I would be remiss. And by remiss, I mean I would feel super freaking guilty if I didn't also talk to you about taxes species, which are ewes, which look a lot like your firs and your spruces to the untrained eye and a lot of places like using them as ornamentals. I can't get away from them here in Columbus. They are everywhere. People love them in their yards. And I mean, I get it. They're a hardy little bean. Uh, they cut into shapes real well. But uh, unlike the other conifers where you can eat pretty much all of them, uh, taxa species are very hazardous, very toxic. I will throw in the one fun fact because I do want to be honest with you, and we're all probably adults here, the red arils that they produce around their seeds, their toxic seeds, the red arils though are edible. They don't taste horrible. They're a little gelatinous for my taste. You never expect something straight out of nature to be that slimy. They're pretty slimy. They don't taste bad. I wouldn't recommend anybody go about trying to eat a lot of them or harvest a lot of them for any kind of food purposes. Just because with each one that you pick, the odds of a piece of seed or a whole seed still being inside of them goes up exponentially. Uh, don't tell your children about this. I feel like this is definitely a berry that looks very enticing because it is all like bright red and squishy and, and thick, T-H-I-C-C-C. -C -C. Uh, and so kids will very often be like, oh, I would like to put this into, into my mouth. Um, but if the seed in the center is still there, it is no bueno, no bueno. Um, so we got to learn about the air rules of use today, but maybe we just leave them alone. If you think you are a very careful person and you're very curious, you know, you, you can take it upon yourselves to try an arrow, but I feel like for non-existent legal purposes, I cannot tell you to go and do that but I can tell you that the arrow is edible and only the arrow, literally no other part, none. <laughs> you can take it upon yourself. 
Sarah Molo, you, you get an award. <laughs> okay, so we're moving, we're switching gears from trees. We're gonna talk about some ground bound beans now. I feel like everybody knows at this point that you can eat dandelions, but I wanted to mention them anyway, because the whole dang plant is edible. The roots can be used to make coffee or bitters. If you are making a coffee dupe with the roots, I would suggest chopping it up into small pieces first and then roasting because when you roast dandelion roots, they get real hard. You don't want to put that whole hard root into your spice grinder. You don't need to make your spice grinders day bad. Why would you do that? <laughs> so my pro tip would be chop first, roast, then grind. Or you can literally take the roots out, give them a nice scrubbing, and put them directly into a high proof alcohol to make yourself some bitters for a cocktail sourced directly from your garden with all of the fun nutrition that dandelion roots bring. I, at this time of year, love finding dandelions, but kind of looking down in the rosette for the flower buds that have not put up their stems yet and capering them. You could also caper the unopened buds once they are at the top of their stems, but the inside of them is going to be much fluffier, which worries me in, with like regular pickling practices in terms of whether or not they're pickling comprehensively and how much they are going to try to float in your pickle jar. So usually taking the buds straight from the basil rosette before they get a chance to stemify would be my suggestion if you want to caper them. As I mentioned before, you can make a honey with the blossoms because they do have a very honey reminiscent taste on their own, the yellow parts of dandelion flowers. And that would just be picking the flowers, removing the green bits because they will add a little bit of a vegetal taste. That isn't everyone's favorite thing in their sweets. Put the petals directly into some syrup and uh, let it simmer for a little while. Strain the petals out, let it simmer even more, reduce uh, by like a third so it gets nice and thick once it cools down, and then you can use that in place of honey if honey isn't your jam. Um, of course, you can make salads with the leaves. I like them better once the leaves are cooked or a little bit wilty because once they flower, the greens get a little bitter for my taste. I also love making little fritters with the flowers. I just made a video on that recently. The flowers lend themselves really well to a cornmeal forward fritter dough. They just pair together very nicely and the flowers get all like melty in your mouth in the center when they have been battered and fried. Every, everything is good battered and fried, but I feel like the cornmeal note was an important one to point out for dandelions specifically. Dandelion wine is also a really fun thing that you can do with dandelions. And that would honestly just be the process of making like a sweetened dandelion infused concoction and then adding in your wine yeast and then letting it age for an extended period of time, usually like a minimum of one year. Some people will let it age for two. I, because I am often impatient, will sometimes just do a dandelion fermented cordial, which is still making a sweetened like dandelion juice, and then adding in raw dandelion petals with all of the wild yeast that is still on them, and that yeast will then begin the fermentation process. And I'll let it ferment for about a week. Ooh, I'm gonna sneeze. <laughs> Tell no one that I squeak when I sneeze. That is a secret that we are keeping between friends. It's a secret we're keeping between friends. Um, but the yeast from those raw petals added into the sugary dandelion liquid will begin the fermentation process. And typically after a week, you'll have fizz. After two weeks, it'll start getting a bit drier because um, you're going to want it to be a little sweeter than you want it to be when you start the process. And it's really fun and nice. You just got to make sure that you stir it once or twice a day so the uh, tops don't get moldy because petals like to float to the top of things. <laughs> And thank you to the friend that said bless you. I appreciate you. <laughs> Next is wood sorrel. I often see wood sorrel getting conflated with clovers, which honestly is far from the worst thing because clovers are also edible. But wood sorrel and the oxalis species in general uh, have a much more interesting taste raw than you will get from clovers. Clovers are going to be very green, very vegetal. Uh, with the flowers being very sweet, whereas sorrel, 
uh, whose aliases are sour, sour grass and lemon clover, uh, is extremely lemony eaten raw right out of the ground. When I used to go to sleepaway camp as a kid, I was notorious for just pulling up handfuls of wood sorrel on hikes and just snacking on it as we walked. Um, me and my friends would call them nature's lemon heads because they are that lemony and they're a little bit sweet. That being said, they do skew really well for both sweet and savory dishes. Wherever you need some brightness where you would add a little bit of lemon zest or a little bit of lemon juice, you can just throw some wood sorrel in instead. It's free. You don't have to go to the grocery store to get that one lemon that you need for that recipe from the New York Times cooking blog that you decided you were going to make this weekend. We love a free option. A thing to keep in mind, there is oxalic acid in wood sorrel. For people who are prone to kidney stones, if it's like a very prevalent thing in your family, I'm not saying don't eat it. I'm just saying don't eat it every day uh, or don't even eat it every week. Uh, I see people coming down hard on a lot of, on wood sorrel in particular, but a lot of wild plants for things like that. With garlic mustard, I see people coming down on it and being like, aren't there, isn't there a little bit of small like cyanide compounds in it? And with garlic mustard, I'm like, yes, but that is true for literally every brassica, including the very trendy kale that you are buying at Whole Foods right now. And just like with wood sorrel, oxalic acid is also present in spinach, which our society cannot get enough of spinach. Uh, so also, if your family's prone to kidney stones, it might be time to break up with spinach. I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news. Um, but I just wanted to throw that little tidbit in there because I do feel like wild plants come under a lot of scrutiny that you don't see a lot of our cultivated plants coming under. Yes, talk to your urologist if you're worried. Yes, Danielle, exactly. Next is Perslane, Portulaca, Oleracea, and I, I love it because it's just like this cute little su succulent bean that likes growing where nobody else likes growing. It is thriving in the heat of the summertime when most of us are melting. And I love that for purslane. Um, everything above the ground is edible. Uh, like I, I was going to say exactly what I wrote down. Good job, past Alexis. Nothing wrong with the roots. They're just not really worth it in my opinion. And if you leave some of the roots and some of the plant behind, it'll just grow more purslane. And what's wrong with that? It is deliciously crunchy, put fresh into a nice summertime salad. Um, and it's really good on sandwiches instead of lettuce because lettuce has no taste. It's just crunchy water. Why do we love iceberg lettuce so much? I don't understand. It also pickles really well. Um, one of my forager friends, Eric of the Woods, um, who is an Asian American forager just next door in Indianapolis who makes a ton of kimchi himself, has made kimchi with Perslane and turned me on to doing that last year. And it is delicious. It is so good. Highly recommend to a friend. And it is uh, one of the plants with the highest amount of omega-3 fatty acids. So I don't know if you're being real cognizant of your fatty acid intake for your joints. Perslane's a really good one to become friends with. I will say it is a plant that likes growing in a lot of areas that you might not want to be foraging from, but if it's, say, taking over your garden beds, don't get mad at it, just have a snack. <laughs> do, do, do. And now we're going to get into two plants that are a bit more specialized, like a bit more regional here in the United States. So for everyone who is in the Midwest, the Mid-Atlantic, the Northern part of the Southeast and the Southern part of the Northeast, congratulations, you're in pawpaw territory. How does it feel to have this fun special plant maybe hiding somewhere very close to you? It is the state native fruit of Ohio, love it. And it's one of my favorite forage fruits. And while it's not my absolute favorite taste-wise, that would be June berries, it is up there when you find a good one. Pawpaws vary a ton between trees, so much between trees. And even if you find a good one, they don't breed true. Uh, so planting the seeds from one that you had that was just like especially delicious, especially pineapple-y, especially mango-y, planting, planting those seeds does not mean that in seven to 10 years, you will have a pawpaw that tastes the exact same. It could taste better. It could taste worse. 
Um, we're starting to move into a world where we have named pop pop cultivars, and all of those exist because of cuttings and grafting. Yes, I see Tom mentioning grafting in the chat. Exactly. Um, and you can also start, but words are hard. Some of those named cultivars are for sale in certain areas. I know here in Ohio, we can usually find like the Susquehanna pawpaws and a couple of others. Whenever the pawpaw festival happens in Southern Ohio, I feel like that's a time when I tell people in Ohio to go and buy a specific cultivar if there's one that they feel very partial towards. Um, but the edible part of pawpaws is the soft pulp of the ripe fruit. They do go bad so fast, though. Yes, Catherine. I will say, much like how a lot of people like bananas, I wouldn't know. I'm allergic to bananas. I do love pawpaws when they are, like, so ripe, they, like, might be rotting tomorrow. When they are, like, very fragrant, the outside skin has gotten very mottled with brown, and they're super soft. Like, you can just rip them open. You don't even need to use a knife anymore that is the time where i love them because that is the point where the sugars in them are the most developed uh it is very hard to find them in that state in nature though because typically they fall before they get to that point and then an animal will happen upon them and be like ah a surprise treat for me a uh, lonesome raccoon in the woods what a bounty the sky has rained upon me this day and then they go to town in terms of pawpaws, to make sure that you are getting ones that are ripe and that you are not taking unripe ones home, my suggestion is to take the very skinny little trunk of the tree and just give it a light little, just the lightest little shake. Ones that are ready to be eaten will fall to the ground. If they're really ready to, to be eaten, they might explode a little bit when they hit the ground, but usually they'll just get a little dent where, uh, where they make contact and then you can gather them and take them home. The issue with gathering pawpaws that are too underripe, and when I say too underripe, I mean you push a thumb into it and it doesn't leave any kind of an indentation. It's too hard for that. A lot of times those guys will like rot on your countertop before they get ripe enough that you want to eat them. So if you come across a honey hole of pawpaws, but it's a you know two weeks, three weeks before they're supposed to be ripe, it's not a great idea to just cut them all down and take them home. You will just be a sad panda in a couple of weeks when you cut into them and they are not what you hoped they would be. <laughs> um, yeah, uses wherever one would use bananas. At least that's how I use them because I literally can't use bananas. They do have a decidedly more tropical flavor than bananas in my opinion, or maybe everyone's just so familiar with bananas that we don't think of them as tasting particularly tropical. I was able to eat bananas as a kid. I cannot eat them any longer. And from what I remember, pawpaws are more exciting. <laughs> but the flavors, once again, they vary a lot from tree to tree. So shop around, walk through the woods. They like hanging out near uh, body, small bodies of water. If you know of any small rivers or small creeks and you live in an area where pawpaws are native, Go and take a walk in the late summer. You will recognize their humongous gross, glossy green leaves from a distance. And they're kind of short stature compared to a lot of other trees that you tend to see in the same areas. And uh, look up and see if they have any fruits that they're hiding. Pawpaws are flowering right now in central Ohio. So this is a good time to go and see what pawpaws are even of the age where they could be producing fruits right now. Cause they do need to be, uh, I would say on average about seven, maybe even like eight years old before they start flowering and fruiting consistently. Um, but you do want to get them a buddy to pollinate with if you say want to have some pawpaws at your house and it needs to be a buddy that they are not genetically identical to. Also a warning, if you plant them at your house, pawpaws love spreading clonally. They will just make tiny little clones of themselves off of their root systems, which is cool when you come across them in nature. They'll have these really dense stands of them sometimes. Um, but yeah, once it is, oh man, I feel like I've found ripe pawpaws as early as the last week of August and as late as the last week of September here in Ohio. And that's kind of the, the time frame within their growing range uh, in which you will find ripe ones. One of my papa's rootstock is throwing rootsuckers up. 
I know. And it's just like, no, stop. Put all of that energy into one spot, buddy. You're spreading yourself too thin. <laughs> and then next is the American persimmon, sweet Diospiros virginiana. Not a lot. I feel like even fewer people than the people who know about pawpaws know that we have a native Diospiros species. A lot of times you can go to the grocery store, to your international market, and see like Diospiros cocky, which is one of the imported um, types of persimmons. In fact, they grow really well in like California. So you'll see a lot of people having Asian persimmons growing. I even have one neighbor that manages to get Asian persimmons to grow here in Ohio. I don't know how they're magic, but our native persimmon, which is much more cold hardy is, uh, yeah, the American persimmon, Diospiros virginiana. The edible part is the ripe fruit. I will repeat again, ripe fruit. The thing that I said about pawpaws with like shaking them and then only eating the ones that fall to the ground, that also applies for persimmons. Because even if, even if it looks soft on the tree, even if you reach up and you give it a little squeeze, I'm like, oh, it's attached, but it's already kind of soft. I'm just gonna pick it and eat it. You and your fuzzy mouth feel for the next 10 minutes will know why that is a bad idea. They, while they are underripe, have a ton of tannins. Those tannins break down as they come into ripeness throughout the uh, late summer into the fall and even into the early winter. You don't, you don't want to be biting into them while they are still very tannin laden. They will turn your mouth into the Sahara Desert. But if the Sahara Desert was also somehow fuzzy, it's simultaneously drying and very like fuzzy feeling making. And I will, re I will repeat, you will know if it's not right because a not ripe one will make you not want to eat one again. <laughs> and to that, I say, oh my God, no, please just go back and look for the ones that have already fallen onto the ground and gather those and take them home. Um, that's it's like a really easy gathering process because you just pick them up off of the ground they do get very soft almost like a caramely like a grainy caramely consistency on the inside once they are ripe so sometimes when they fall they will split and that is most unfortunate but if they get a little bit of dirt on them brush the dirt off and you know you're gonna probably be heat processing them in some way shape or form when you take them home anyway you'll be fine there's a park near our house that has one and a lot of times if we're walking our dog through the park we'll stop by the tree first during that season and we'll both get one uh kind of boop the seeds out of them and then just eat the uh the soft flesh out of the skin as we are walking around the ones near me do taste very caramely when they are perfectly ripe without having to do anything to them but once again right okay i feel like i got the message across on that one and then some book recommendations oh scott points out waiting until the first frost yes i will say here in ohio for the last two years they have started coming into ripeness before we have gotten our first frost which is like I love climate change. No, I don't. That was facetious. Um, so here we have some book recommendations because I get asked all the time where one should start. When trying to pick one for the Mid-Atlantic, it was actually very hard because there is not yet a Mid-Atlantic foraging book in the regional foraging series. That being said, you can buy Northeast foraging and Southeast foraging and probably have a whole lot of overlap. Uh, we see fiddleheads being featured in the Northeast Foraging book. We see Diospiros virginiana being featured on the cover of the Southeast Foraging book. So if you're in those areas, that's what I would suggest. If you are spread out across the rest of the United States, in that same series of books is also Midwest Foraging. Um, there is Southwest Foraging. California gets its own freaking book. There's California foraging, and then there is Northwest foraging. Uh, and they cover pretty wide swaths. I know we have, I have the Midwest foraging book, and it covers not only the United States portion of the Midwest, but also up into Ontario. So those books are a really fun series, and they don't dive super deep into every plant, but they're a great place to start to see what the possibilities are and see what's out there. Next, I would suggest any of Samuel Thayer's books. He's so cool. He's so great about writing about plants in such an informative but approachable way. 
Also with his books, Nature's Garden and Forager's Harvest, they have, in fact, I have my copy of Forager's Harvest right here. Didn't even plan for that to happen. I just like it a lot and I reread foraging books constantly. I will show you my favorite part of this book. Beep, 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 beep. This is my page flipping song. We're filling the dead air with me singing dumb things. Oh my God, here it is. It is a chart organized by time that tells you when to expect all of the plants he talks about to come into season. And he even teaches you how to account for the fact that you do not live in the Northern Midwest like he does, which, oh, you made me bigger like I should have remembered to do. I'll hold it up once more. I am but a goob. We're flipping, we're flipping, we're flipping. There it is. Yeah. Look at that with the dark green uh, kind of showing that that is peak season to be gathering and light green showing that it might not be peak season, but you can probably still find some, which is just a really helpful breakdown to see as a new forager. And yeah, support Samuel Thayer. He's amazing. I feel like he's the cool uncle of all of us in the foraging community, but specifically us in the Midwest. Uh, and it is my goal simply for him to know that I exist. And then another uh, suggestion, less for the identification side of it and more for I brought home all of these plants, now what? Side of it is Forage Harvest Feast by Marie Viljoen. She is a Brooklyn-based forager by way of South Africa. So one, she talks a lot about foraging in the city and the kinds of considerations that she takes living in a place that isn't just busy, it's New York busy but she's an extremely skilled chef and baker and shows you a lot of very creative ways to incorporate your foraged finds into your food that you may not have thought of otherwise. It's not always fritters and wilted greens. Uh, Marie's book is phenomenal. Cannot recommend it enough. It has an amazing chapter on pawpaws. That alone, I feel, is a good enough reason to buy it. I see that someone is shouting out fallingfruit.org, which I absolutely love that website. And while we are talking about it, the app iNaturalist is also really great for its explore map that shows you plants, fungi, and animals that other people have geotagged in your area, a lot of which then get to uh, have their ID checked and named research grade by academics who are in that space going and confirming that you did find what you think that you found. My only caveat with iNaturalist is maybe if you're not in the sharing mood, maybe don't tag things that you don't want to share because especially after this year that we have had in quarantine, there are a lot more people on iNaturalist even in your area than you think. And if someone say, I don't know, Geo tags Alexis's favorite persimmon tree because they're a sweet, curious bean who just wanted to know in the middle of summer what that tree full of green fruits was. What that means is that Alexis will never find enough persimmons to make persimmon beer ever again, which is fine. I don't own the tree. The tree is not mine, but it's just something to think about when you're moving through the world. And you can use the functionality where it gives you suggestions for what it thinks you're looking at without having to commit to dropping a tag. I will tell you that too. Uh, so it's also a great learning tool for when you're going out and you've gotten your feet wet, but you don't feel 100% secure and maybe a plant that you're just getting to know. It's really nice to have that as another, uh, just something else to check yourself off of. Though I will say, nothing is as good as going out into the world with someone who knows more than you. No book can show you the plants in all three dimensions. No book can show you the plants in perfect scale in a way that makes sense to your brain. Um, so there's nothing better than finding a friend, say in a local foraging Facebook group, and just hanging out with them for a day and having them point out everything that they see. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alexis. This is awesome. Can we keep you for like 10 more minutes of questions? Oh, yes, too. Yes. Awesome. So let's see. I'm trying to pick. We've got lots of cues in our questions tab. And I'm going to start with, um, do you have any recommendations? You kind of started on this path for other awesome foragers, especially BIPOC foragers that you recommend we check out. 
Oh, absolutely. So if you're in the Midwest, Eric of the Woods is absolutely fantastic. He is another one that is so creative with his forage finds in terms of the food that he makes. He's also he also like runs a piece of pizza business off of his back porch and uses a lot of his forage finds in his pizza. So if you're in Indianapolis, uh, go buy a porch pizza and follow Eric of the Woods on Instagram. Um, if you are out on the West Coast, one of my personal heroes is Indy, Indy Aficionalis. Oh my gosh. Her, one, her page is absolutely beautiful. If you ever need a break from the gentle chaos that is the visual aspect of my Instagram, please go look at Indy's. It's a very informative palette cleanser uh, because she is a much more accomplished photographer and videographer than I am. She is LA based. And she also runs a couple community gardens in Skid Row and uses a lot of what she forages and what she grows to better support the houseless community in the Los Angeles area. So she's also just, she's a model and a great person and a great forager, which like, how does it feel being the universe's favorite? Ask Indy because I don't know. <laughs> those would be, those would be my two recommendations right off the bat. Um, also, if you are looking for an organization that teaches children of color to forage and get better acquainted with their surroundings, Backyard Base Camp in Maryland is a great organization to support, and their page is really fun to follow, too. That is awesome. Thank you, Alexis. Um, I'm going to dive into another question here. We've got Catherine saying, I have bad seasonal allergies. Um, to pretty much everything. We got a lot of allergies. Um, how do you test whether you're allergic to something? And are there methods of preparation to reduce allergens uh, for found and foraged food? I wish that I had a very easy answer to this question. Because my answer to this question is it would probably be the smartest for you because I don't want you to suffer to get to the bottom of these specific odds and ends and bits and bobs on plants that are setting off your allergies. If it's just a generalized pollen allergy and that's what sets you off, then yeah, when you're bringing home fruits, always make sure that you rinse things off. I have a friend who has a horrible pollen allergy, cannot eat raw apples. Like if we went to an apple orchard and she took a bite of an apple straight off the tree, would have a horrible time. But once things are washed and or thoroughly cooked, is is a-okay but a lot of that is just zeroing in on exactly what it is that sets off your allergies um i'm allergic to some of the pollen in the air right now specifically freaking bradford pears they're just awful they're just good for nothing even though the ones on my street since they are so prolific uh mine mind you fruit bradford's are not supposed to fruit that's one of the reasons why cities wanted to plant them so much for that uh, and i do get to make perry out of them in the winter time but it's not worth how sneezy i am for the first week of april um and there are probably some plants in general that i would suggest staying away from don't hang out with the conifers right now because conifer pollen is very fine even compared to some of the other pollen in the air right now and that'll set off people who don't have that bad of allergies so just some things to keep in mind i just don't want you to rub things that you're allergic to onto your body ah. thank you for that alexis um speaking of conifer pollen how do you collect pollen from conifers yeah absolutely so the nice thing right now is all of the pollen cones on the spruces and the pines aren't open all the way yet they are just starting to so you can go and gather all of the almost opened ones before they start spreading them put them into a bowl in a dry area and they will dry out a little open up and release their pollen and then at that point you can just kind of sift it out you can go and pour the contents of the bowl uh, into a little sifter and sift the pollen into a bowl underneath and then you could cook with the pollen cones if you really wanted to. They're just like a fun source of fiber in a, in a dish, or you can go ahead and compost them. Awesome, thank you. And we have got a question from Caitlin. She says, sometimes I feel guilty for collecting flowering plants because I feel like I'm taking away from pollinators. Is this a real concern? So <laughs> that one is always 
tough because it depends on the plant that you're gathering from. For a lot of ornamental species or imported species, especially for our native pollinators, that's not what a lot of them would be choosing otherwise. And it's really a game of numbers, right? So if you come to a field in your neighborhood that is covered in dandelions and you take 5% of those dandelions, you are still leaving a substantial amount for the pollinators. When I made my crabapple milk tree, I don't think I even took I, I don't think I even took 1% of the available crabapple blossoms uh, from any of the three trees that I gathered from. And so in that way, I don't feel like I am, one, putting the tree at a disadvantage for putting out all the fruit that it wants to, and two, denying all of our local pollinators of a really nice snack. But say if you have one crab apple tree in your entire neighborhood and it's pretty diminutive and you don't have a whole lot of other flowering trees maybe maybe making crab apple milk tea isn't the move maybe you wait for those crab apples to fruit and then later on in the year in the fall you can make like a nice little apple cider or even just snack on a couple of them or candy them or bake them so it's all about assessing what you are looking at Thank you, Alexis. And we've got a question from Carly. How do you find the time for foraging and processing what you forage in addition to your day job? I should sleep more is my answer to that question. I should absolutely sleep more. Um, but I love everything that I do so much that, that all of that stuff doesn't feel like work. Going out and gathering feels like playing. Processing is a very meditative process for me. Uh, I'm I'm a freaking weirdo. If I go out and forage all day, I will come back and process in complete silence in my kitchen and just like reflect on the day and reflect on how thankful I am for everything that I'm having the opportunity to process and daydream about all of the cool things that I want to make with them. Uh, so I make the time because it's something that I really love and I'm truly passionate about. That being said, I could probably sleep about another hour or two each night. <laughs> Thank you, Alexis. And we've got, um, we've got a lot of questions about how do you figure out where are places that are okay to forage from um, in terms of like restrictions? So I know in DC, we've got a lot of national parks. So do you have any recommendations for figuring out where folks um, or how folks can figure out if they're allowed to forage in certain places? Yeah, absolutely. Historically, foraging laws are um, purposefully obtuse in a lot of places. And I saw some people very kindly doing some educating at the beginning of this program on kind of a, a bit of the history of a lot of those laws and the fact that... Uh, a lot of those laws do have a, a, quite a bit of racist history. So when it comes down to it, you really just have to know park by park. National parks vary between park systems. National or state forests and state parks vary between the parks. I know here in Ohio, you can forage in like Wayne National Forest, but you need permits for certain plants, the plants being like wild ginger and ginseng and the cohosh. Um, but in like Cuyahoga National Park, I'm at least the last time that I checked on the laws, they also change sometimes. You can forage like nuts and berries, but everything else is like not fair game. So it's all about acquainting yourself with the rules of the specific place that you are going to. And if it is hard to find those rules, like it almost always is, don't feel bad about calling a park ranger. Honestly, that's probably going to be one of the more enjoyable questions that they get to answer that day. Uh, and some park rangers are even like really excited to show you about some of the useful plants that are hiding within their parks. But do your research before you get there. Uh, I'm also lucky that with one of the parks here in the city that I really like harvesting from, they just simply don't have rules about it. Like I've talked, I've talked to the park manager and it's like, mm, it's just like never a thing that we've had to think about. So we just don't, we just don't have rules about it. But that park also hosts like a maple tapping festival at the beginning of the spring season each year. So like they're also just big on encouraging people to have that kind of symbiotic relationship with their surroundings, which is why I think they're kind of loosey goosey about it. But do your research. And if the laws are overly, uh, 
Reductive isn't the word that I wanted to use there. Come on, brain, it's not early in the morning anymore. If your laws are too tough, talk to your local politicians. That is something that I'm kind of big on lobbying because while it's very easy for people to say that those laws are coming from a point of conservation, more often than not, those laws were actually originally put in place to disenfranchise uh, poor people and often people of color from being able to gather food in public places. Before the Civil War, uh, hunting, trapping, gathering in public places was very commonplace in the United States, like it is still commonplace in public spaces in some of the UK. But then they, so then they freed the slaves and they wanted to keep them financially binded to plantations. And so they were like, oh, actually, uh, foraging in public places isn't allowed anymore. And also now trespass is a criminal offense instead of a civil one. Have fun. Bye. And then that's how sharecropping happened. Anyways, that was a very uh, spark notes version of the history behind some of those laws. And a lot of conservation laws are also kind of like gently rooted in racism back in the like 1880s and the 1890s, a bunch of old white men were just like, we need to leave these lands in pristine condition so we can take a break from our hectic city lives to go and visit them. Not knowing that the pristine condition that they were in was often because of millennia of, a, of symbiotic relationships between the indigenous people that inhabited those spaces and those spaces. Um, and that sometimes when you are not tending to those spaces, both through the method of like food gathering and through just purposeful land management, bad things can happen, <laughs> which we're now learning, which we're now learning. Oh, thank you, Alexis. I'm gonna ask one last question. A lot of folks are wondering, when's the cookbook coming out? Are you going oh to, are interested in? Is it is there something a, I'm interested in. Out? I am, I am in talks with book people right now. The writing process has begun. Uh, as we talked about, I'm a very busy bean. So every once in a while, when I really get the, the writing bug, I will sit down and like crank out an essay. And sometimes it'll become my Earth Day video. And, but sometimes it goes into a little folder on my computer titled book question mark. And once I feel like I've built up enough essays and then matching recipes. I think that's the way that I want to do it. Because um, I feel like giving context to the recipes is the way that I like to go, but I'm also not verbose enough to be like Marie, who wrote Forage Harvest Feast, who has like these beautiful three huge pages of just text before you get to the recipes. I'm like, oh, that couldn't be me. Uh, that absolutely could not be me. I'll give you one page of text before we get to the recipes. <laughs> And then on the recipe page, also give you all of like the fun pertinent information and hopefully have some good photos. Uh, I feel like I roast books for having subpar photos in terms of IDing all the time. And now I'm just like, oh man, now I have to <laughs> put my money where my mouth is and do better. Well, we're excited. In the meantime, we will follow you on socials, Alexis. And I just want to thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing your expertise. 